Good morning from ZTN Studios here in Harare, Zimbabwe. Welcome to the National Purse. Today's discussion is on uh, the understanding public finance management, fiscal framework, policies and rules. This broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network ZTN and our partners, the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development. Zim Code, hello, I am Yolanda Gumbo. And I'm Candice Mwakanyele. Now, in this discussion, we will focus on understanding public finance management, specifically looking at how to obtain the fiscal frameworks, policies, and the rules. However, before we begin, I would like to ask our guests today to introduce themselves briefly to our audience, starting, of course, with the gentleman on my left. Thank you. My name is Pepka Ichiwari. I work for the Parliament Budget Office. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. My name is Barbara Mewasha. I'm coming from the University of Zimbabwe, the Department of Political and Administrative Studies. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Tafadzo Chikumbu. I work for the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, of course, to get into our discussion, it may be important for us to first establish um, what is a public finance management. And I think, Tafadzo, let's start this question off with you. Okay, uh, sure, it is important to understand what really it is. And public finance management, um, we're looking at um, uh, public finances, which are kept by the state. And uh, when we look, talk about public finance management, we then talk about the means and ways in which the government has to manage those public funds. And as you know that we, the government collects funds and they normally put it in the consolidated revenue fund. So the management of those funds starts from the management of even the collection itself, the collection of the funds, um, how it is kept in the consolidated revenue fund, and also how it is utilized. So. It, it, it is a whole chain in terms of how the funds are collected, how they are kept, and also how they are utilized. Is it in line with the provisions of the Constitution, the Public Finance Management Act, and other related acts of Parliament? All right, thank you. Uh, Barbara, would you add anything to that? Yes, I, will, I will also want to add something <coughs> to say that uh, with public finance management, um, the public uh, are the owners of the money that is used by the government sector. So they are the principals which means that uh, all the activities that are done in the public sector, they are done within the confinements of uh, the taxpayers' money. For that reason, the government should be held accountable. That's why we have public finance management, whereby we are looking at how the government mobilizes its funds, how it utilizes those funds, and also how it monitors and manages those funds for the public good. They are more like the agent, and then the public are the principal, so they have to be accountable. All right. Okay, now as we ease into the topic, we know what it is, but why is it important in terms of an economic aspect of the nation on a personal level and on a national level? Maybe we'll start with you, Tafazo. Okay. Um, yeah, public finance management is, is very important. Like what my colleague said, that uh, most of the resources, they are generated from the public by way of paying of taxes, and I'm sure you also pay taxes on one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, even those that don't go to work, they pay 2% tax, they pay evaluated tax. And for that reason, the government has to be accountable to the citizens. So it is important, um, even in terms of how each cent or each dollar is being utilized. And for that reason, it is important for, 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 for the public officers to ensure that the resources are used prudently, efficiently, and in the most effective manner. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's take a look maybe at the framework that is there uh, currently. Now, mm -hmm. Pepukai, let me bring you in here. So what does the Constitution of Zimbabwe say about public finance management? Um, and what is Parliament's role when we look at ensuring that the executive is following PFM best practices as enshrined in the Constitution? Thank you, Peps. Let me start by clarifying that uh, when we talk about public finance management, it's not only at central government level, mm -hmm. but it goes down even to local authorities. So public finance is not only a central government thing. And uh, the constitution provides for public finance management, particularly chapter 17 of the constitution, that is sections 298 to sections 317. They provide for public finance management. Um, let me start with section 298. It lays the principles for good public finance management. These include transparency, accountability, equity, which means um, the burden of taxation should be f shared equally amongst the citizens. And also the benefits of public finance, the benefits of government spending, should be also shared uh, equally amongst the citizens of Zimbabwe, which means uh, public finance management should take cognizance of 
um, the different uh, sectors in the economy and also the different provinces, those so-called marginalized areas and uh, marginalized people. And uh, Section 299 then lays the, uh, imposes the oversight role on parliament in as far as public finance management is concerned. So the, uh, the uh, sp supreme law of the land lays the foundation for public finance management. Of course, we have other subsidiary legislation that we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. And uh, the role of parliament is clearly laid out in the constitution. For Section 305 of the same constitution uh, says the Minister of Finance must present the national budget in parliament. So it's the role of parliament to approve the national budget. After approving the national budget, they oversee implementation of the same budget uh, to make sure that it is in line with the legislative intent. And also, when the Auditor General audits uh, expenditure by all spending departments, that audit report comes back to parliament. So it is the role of parliament again to offer recommendations on how best to improve public finance management in the country. Okay, and I see you mentioned that they do play a role and you mentioned oversight in there. Do you feel that Parliament is playing that role effectively and efficiently, the oversight role? Of course, uh, they, there is need uh, to improve in some aspects, but as far as uh, in, um, budget approval and budget drafting is concerned, Parliament is, is playing its part. It's consulting the public and it's, uh, it's, it's um, debating the budget, uh, taking into account the best interests of the country. And also all the reports that come from the Auditor General coming to Parliament, and Parliament is offering recommendations on how to improve public finance management in Zimbabwe. So I can say that Parliament is playing its part. Of course, there are needed gritties that need to be, uh, some, some, some loose screws that need to be tightened, especially mm -hmm. with regards to improving the public finance management legislation in Zimbabwe so that uh, Parliament can play an effective role and hence its effectiveness in the, in, in the, the oversight role. Barbara, uh, public finance. Uh, Barbara, let me bring it to you. Um, he says, yes, we are, <laughs> we're playing our role as effectively as we can here. What do you think, looking in from the outside? Yeah, I agree with what Mr. Pepuka is saying, that the Parliament of Zimbabwe has made greater strides in terms of uh, overseeing expenditures but it's not enough. More still needs to be done. We such as? Uh, we see, w such as the effective oversight when we talk of the budgeting process. Mm -hmm. He was saying that they approve the budget, they go through the process of debating the budget, but uh, we have seen in our case that our MPs, they normally require the Minister of Finance maybe to buy them cars before they go ahead and approve the budget, which, which one tends to doubt, uh, mm -hmm. to question their oversight role when they make it a condition that they need uh, something for them to conduct the process. So it is still questionable. And also, even though we are saying we have the parliament to, to oversee uh, unauthorized expenditures and other uh, expenses in the government entities, we still find that we have illicit financial flows and we also have mismanagement of our, our state funds. So I think most still needs to be done. Okay, Tafazo, do you have, <laughs> have yeah, anything to um, throw into this discussion? I, I think the issue of um, the role of parliament, like Chiwara said, um, they do the oversight, but I think even in public finance management, they actually play the three key roles of parliament, which includes uh, the making of laws, legislation. I think it is their role to do so. And um, uh, for me, I, I would rate them high in terms of putting up legislation. 100% they are doing their job. But then when it comes to the actual oversight, mm. I think they are, they are progressively getting there. Because um, I think we do have experiences, especially with regard to debt management in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. where um, the Minister of Finance the former ministers of finance, they would actually control, um, contract debts over and above the statutory limits mm -hmm. to the extent that uh, our external and domestic debts, they overshoot to the current state. I think uh, looking at the current uh, exchange rate, uh, we may need uh, four years without spending our money and, and debt getting all the money towards debt repayment. So it is, it is that component of, of the oversight which I think the, the parliament did not do well. But like I said, progress, progressively they are getting there in terms of um, actually questioning, asking difficult questions to the Minister of Finance, summoning the different uh, heads of ministries and, and, and ministers to, to parliament to answer 
for some of the irregularities that would have been uh, identified by the Auditor General. So they still need a lot to do in terms of What is oversight. that lot? What is that lot that they still need to do? Yeah, actually, you know, when people talk about Parliament, they talk about their teeth. They, they, their role is to, to, to exercise uh, their oversight in terms of um, calling the ministers. And when they appear before Parliament, they present and answer to their questions. If they are not satisfied, they have to take action beyond just calling them. Uh, for um, for answering questions. Uh, I think in the case of Zimbabwe, um, especially when the Auditor General's report comes out, it goes to Parliament. Parliament um, investigates in terms of the issues. They call the responsible departments to come and answer questions. After that, they give a report to, 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 to Zaki to do investigations, further investigations. Mm -hmm. um, then thereafter, they, they don't follow up in terms of what would have happened uh, with the reports that were submitted to Zaki. If Zaki decides not to do their job, then the story uh, ends there. So we want Parliament to ensure that their oversight role extends and ensure that even the resources that are lost, they are brought back uh, to the government coffers. Can I, can I yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> section 119 of the Constitution says that all institutions are accountable to Parliament. So like he is saying, uh, he is saying that if Zaki doesn't do his job, the issues die away. Uh, Zaki is also accountable to Parliament. So if they don't do their job, Parliament will ask them. Barbara um, said um, we have seen Parliament uh, making inroads in as far as um, parliamentarians making inroads in as far as their welfare is concerned. That is what the media reports. But behind that, what is reported, there are a lot of issues that come uh, that come with budget approval. You know, Parliament approves. Uh, government to raise revenue. They approve taxation of the government. They also allocate revenue to different sectors of the economy. To say education will get this, this one will get this. And also they also allocate to parliament to say in as far as the uh, uh, operations of parliament are concerned you are, you are going to get this. And that includes the wealth of parliamentarians. So it's only that uh, those um, sensitive issues are the ones which are reported. But behind that there's a lot of work that is done. So I think uh, Parliament has been doing its work, but there are certain areas that we may need to improve, especially regarding citizen engagement. Mm -hmm. That area, I can say that we have not been doing well. Why? Because uh, our attributed to limited resources. We have not been able to be in every area in as far as consulting the people is concerned. Um, what we have done is we prioritize certain areas this year Next year, we go to different areas to consult the public. And also, uh, with regards to uh, the low internet penetration ratio, in developed countries, they use ICT to consult the public. Mm -hmm. But because of low internet penetration ratios in Zimbabwe, uh, issues to do with the, the cost involved, we have not been able to get uh, feedback from the citizens in as much as we should do. So that's the area that I think we should improve. And also, uh, the effectiveness and as far as uh, recommendations are concerned, like uh, Tafaz was saying, Parliament makes recommendations. We also follow up on the recommendations, but it's up to us to communicate to the public so that they are aware of what has happened. I'll give an example of the bill that is before Parliament, the condonation bill. It's a, as a result of uh, Parliament's engagement in public finance management, where Parliament was very strict to say, government, you have been uh, engaged in unauthorized expenditure. Can you come and condone unauthorized expenditure as provided for in the Constitution? That's part of the Parliament work. Okay, Pepukai. And I know earlier on you mentioned um, the Constitution, that there are sections that cater for public finance management, but are there any other pieces of legislation or statutes that govern public finance management in Zimbabwe? Uh, there are various pieces of legislation that govern pu public finance management, starting with the Public Finance Management Act itself, uh, which is provided for in Section 299 of the Constitution, which says Parliament must pass a legislation to govern public finance management in, uh, in Zimbabwe. And that law is the Public Finance Management Act. And the Public Finance Management Act uh, um, is an elevated status because Section 4 of the PFMA seg says uh, if in the event of any, any inconsistency with any legislation governing public finance management in Zimbabwe, then the PFMA will prevail. So it's the supreme law that governs.
public finance management outside the constitution. But there are other various pieces of legislation which include uh, the Reserve Bank Act, um, the Public Debt Management Act, uh, there's also the Corporate Governance, uh, Public Entities Corporate Governance Act, among other pieces of legislation. But uh, let me specifically mention the Reserve Bank Act and the Public uh, uh, Debt Management Act. Uh, as they relate to Public Finance Management Act. Mm -hmm. They regulate the amount of debt that government can contract to at most 70% of uh, GDP in the country. So uh, whenever government uh, feels that they need to borrow, they should not borrow beyond 70% and that's provided for in the Public Debt Management Act. And the Reserve Bank Act, you know, when government runs short of money, they can go to the central bank to borrow. And uh, Section 11 of the Reserve Bank Act provides for uh, that borrowing not to exceed 20% of the previous year's revenue. So it's again part of uh, Parliament to oversee and ensure that those thresholds are not exceeded. But like what Tafaz was saying, uh, we have seen uh, in some years those thresholds being exceeded and the uh, government uh, giving uh, very valid excuses on why they exceeded those thresholds. Okay, but um, okay, you are saying they give valid um, excuses, but if it is law, surely there it's should be a line drawn somewhere. Anybody can justify anything. Uh, it's not absolute. It says uh, those thresholds may be exceeded in the event of unforeseen circumstances which warranty you to exceed those. So we thought they were unforeseen circumstances that warrant uh, government to exceed those thresholds. Uh, Barbara, let me, let me, let me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let me just add? say that uh, in the event that uh, a minister decides to borrow or decides to expand beyond the stated limits, he has to approach parliament. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Zimbabwe, that has not been happening. And uh, that's why I always question the tip that we expect parliament to have. And um, as a result, we find ourselves in, in this particular state where we are not able to borrow anymore from the multilateral institutions. And also, we, we are unable to fund our social services because on every budget, we have to allocate certain resources towards debt repayment. And um, I think it is upon the, 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 the parliament to exercise their oversight role. And I also want to go back to the condonation bill that he, he stated. This is a bill that wants to, to clear unauthorized expenditures that were incurred between 2017, 18, 20, yeah, 20, as far back as 2015. Mm. Yet the Constitution itself and the Public Finance Management Act says that they have to gazette any unauthorized uh, expenditure within 60 days. So they want to do a condonation for an expenditure that was done five years ago. So is, is this bending the rules? They're trying to make it... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Are, we, are we trying to cover things mm. up? I, I think from what Chapazo uh, is saying, we have the Constitution specifically saying uh, in Section 307 that the, the Parliament um, has that, that duty, that power to, to pardon unauthorized expenditures, but we should, the Treasurer or the Minister of Finance should seek condonation in the event that we have unauthorized expenditure. And that should be done within 60 days after determining the extent of that unauthorized expenditure. But rarely have we seen um, any, uh, any event whereby the minister is going to come and seek for condonation or for unauthorized expenditure. So it is more like on paper than in real practice. Why okay. is that being practiced, perhaps? Um, uh, the, the section that she referred to says uh, within 60 days of the realization of the unauthorized expenditure. So uh, when, when government accounts and uh, when the reports are bef brought before parliament, when parliament realizes that there has been unauthorized expenditure, they write to ministries seeking or requesting them to condone unauthorized expenditure through the normal processes. And this is the process that has culminated in government coming to parliament to condone unauthorized expenditure from 2015. And government has accepted that they have erred in, uh, in incurring unauthorized expenditure uh, going as far, far back as 2015. And going forward, the minister has promised that 
there won't be any more unauthorized expenditure that is not authorized uh, or that is not b brought before parliament for condonation or for authorization prior to incurring that unauthorized expenditure. So it's historical and we, the minister has, 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 has agreed that uh, there was an oversight on the part of uh, both the government and I think the par parliament in as far as uh, that provision section 307 is concerned. But going forward, uh, we are going to improve. Okay, um, I think <laughs> with that, let's just take a quick breather. Um, now, of course, you are watching the National Press. Our discussion today being understanding public finance management, specifically focusing on fiscal frameworks, policies, and the rules. And do remember this broadcast is brought to you by Zimpapers TV Network, ZTN, and our partners, the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development, Zimcode. We're going to take a quick break, but we will be continuing with this discussion shortly. Do stay tuned. to the national press our discussion today understanding public finance management specifically focusing on fiscal framework policies and the rules and this broadcast is brought to you by zim papers television network ztn and our partners the zimbabwe coalition on debt and development zimcond all right now um before we went for a break you were telling us their processes to condoning um, unauthorized expenditure can you just talk us through that process how is it supposed to work um, when the Minister of Finance realizes that there has been unauthorized expenditure, within 60 days he brings a bill to Parliament explaining the extent of the unauthorized expenditure and the reasons thereof. And it is up to Parliament to approve or perhaps reject that uh, the, the uh, approving uh, the unauthorized expenditure that has been incurred. So that's the process. Um, so Parliament has been uh, raising the issue with the, the Minister of Finance since 2015 to say there has been unauthorized expenditure, can you come and condone this unauthorized expenditure? And that has not happened. And the Minister of Finance in 2019 eventually brought a bill. It's a consolidated bill that tries to, go to uh, condone unauthorized expenditure from 2015 to 2018. So that's the process that is involved. Okay. Um, now, Barbara, maybe uh, let's ask you, um, he's kind of given a bit of an explanation, but let's ask you from um, a scholastic point of view, what is the state of public finance management in Zimbabwe and is it in line with the provisions um, of the fiscal framework policies that it should be following? Yes, what I can say is that uh, currently we <coughs> have um, um, illicit financial flows and like I said earlier on, um, we have uh, a governance crisis in as far as our public funds are concerned. If we follow the Auditor General's uh, reports yearly, they indicate that billions of dollars are normally lost. Uh, some of the monies are not accounted for and uh, some of uh, the funds, they are lost due to corruption. So uh, we can say our, our status is not uh, pleasant at the moment. And also uh, we have a lot of uh, non-compliance in terms of uh, the laws, the fiscal uh, policies that we have. And uh, with such impunity as if the law did not exist at all, we find that someone can go for unauthorized expenditure and then nothing is done. And even when they are called to appear before the parliament, like what my colleague earlier highlighted, we don't see further action <coughs> to ensure that maybe they are put behind bars or maybe they are given stiff penalties to maybe deter the recurrence of such behaviors. Okay, and you speak of penalties. What are these penalties specifically? Um, uh, let me take that. Mm -hmm. um, the law is very clear. Uh, let me start with the Public Finance Management Act, uh, particularly Section 86, which says that um, there are penalties for um, violation of the Public Finance Management Act in Zimbabwe, particularly relating to issues of reporting, issues of um, uh, management of parastatals, and issues of um, abuse uh, and misuse of state resources. And these penalties uh, range from fines, 
um, imprisonment and uh, even dismissal from work. But however, um, comparing with the other countries, um, I will give an example of Kenya. Uh, some may argue that our penalties are not as deterrent as they should be. In Kenya, any violation of the PFMA uh, that is provided for in Section 112 of the uh, PFMA, any violation of the PFMA will lead to a fine not exceeding 10 million shillings. And the exchange rate of the shilling to the dollar is 1 as 200. So it's quite a substantial amount and it's deterrent enough. Mm -hmm. Or imprisonment not exceeding five years or both. So once you violate the PFMA, you are in trouble in Kenya. And in Uganda, <coughs> uh, you are personally liable for any misuse of resources, which means you need to repay uh, to the citizens and the government whatever you misuse. So in Zimbabwe, people are arguing that it's not deterrent enough, but penalties are there. You they're say there. Yeah. <laughs> they're there, but are there any cases where anybody has been penalized, has been sent to jail, has been fined? Like, have do we, we have any, any cases? action actually being taken? Um, if you if you have been following what has been happening in Parliament, uh, especially with regards to the Public Accounts Committee, we have been they have been following uh, on ish cases of misuse of resources you will realize that uh, the role of parliament is not to imprison people, but they expose it. After exposing, it's up to the law enforcement agents. And uh, we have seen so many people without mentioning names. We, we have been arrested following up on uh, exposes or uh, exposures uh, in parliament. Uh, when the Public Accounts Committee uh, investigated certain issues, then that led to the law enforcement agents following up on those leads and arresting people without mentioning any names. Tafazza looks like he has something yeah. to say. Uh, I think this is something that I've mentioned earlier on, that uh, while it's the parliament has oversight over all institutions, I think it is their, also, their role also to follow up either with the police, with the ZAC, with any other institution in the land to ensure that everything, uh, every responsibility or roles that are put upon them are also being exercised. I think he, on, on, on that note, Mr. Jory, I, I, I think that Parliament is not, is not exercising its roles uh, and responsibilities. And I'm sure that, um, as I said, the Parliament grows and, and they're actually improving progressively. And I, I I'll tell you um, that uh, prior to 2000, we didn't have the committee system that we now have, uh, where serious issues are discussed, policy recommendations are made. Uh, but it is unfortunate that uh, the results or reports that come from the committees, when they get into the House, which, which House proceedings are normally projected, we don't see that kind of seriousness. But there's also serious debates and discussions that happens behind the scenes, which, 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 which debates do not actually see the light, probably because of the politics in the House. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Barbara? Yes, I think um, we should also comment the remarkable progress that the parliament has made, uh, especially in the new dispensation. I think they have um, managed to expose a lot of corrupt activities, uh, but uh, we, we need more to be done, like we said earlier on, because if you just expose people without uh, stringent measures to punish them, then it's of no use. Mm -hmm. We need to have, uh, what, like what other countries are doing, he was referring to Kenya and Uganda. Someone should know that if they misuse or abuse public funds, then they are going to face the wrath. They should be put behind bars. We should have maybe specific sections in our laws stipulating the amount of years that someone can be uh, put in jail maybe for a particular offense and also we should maybe talk about repayment of whatever they could have looted from the government through that system maybe we can end this um, uh, illicit uh, financial flaws. Yeah, Do you know, I, I think, uh, uh, can sorry Tafaz, I've also just realized that mm -hmm. we actually haven't been told what the penalties are. As it currently stands, what are our penalties? Um, they are fines. How uh, much are these fines? Mm -hmm. I may not know them offhand, 
Okay. Because they are subject to change, you know, with the prevailing uh, economic situation. Could they you give revised, us maybe a ballpark? They are revised uh, upwards with, uh, in line with the prevailing economic circumstances. But uh, they range, um, during the U.S. dollar era, they ranged from, I think, $20 to a maximum of about $10,000. Depending, and depending if you on the has the something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> if you consider the amount, people care, it's, it's not that uh, much. Considering someone has embezzled a lot of funds and then um, they are requested to pay twenty dollars, they can afford twenty dollars for embezzlement of funds. I said they range from, you know, they have a schedule of fines. Uh, so I, for offenses which are in category A is twenty dollars, category mm -hmm. C is hundred dollars, category D is ten thousand. But I still so feel depending on the extent. Of, of, uh, the of the offense. Of the offense. But I still feel maybe it's it's going to be little as compared to what they would have taken from the government. Mm -hmm. They are not going to feel the, the, the pain. Tafazo, Before yeah, you elaborate I, on the other ones, Tafazo. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, it's one it's one thing to have the laws. Which laws and penalties you are saying are too little. But it's also another to implement them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my concern is despite the figures, we are, we are not doing anything yes we are not implementing them so i think uh, parliament should actually exercise their oversight role in ensuring that what is in the constitution is being uh, followed mm -hmm. despite the figures <laughs> and then we also have another discussion around how punitive are they mm -hmm. in terms of stopping um, that and i i also want to mention that uh, when she was talking about the state of public finance management in zimbabwe mm -hmm. i think it is for the same reason that uh, we have re recurrent issues. One ministry being fingered into a specific abuse, mm. for example, not following procurement procedures in 2015, 2016, 2017, up to 2019. So if the law is not being implemented, it means the same cases will be recurring. And um, what the government is, is good at doing is that when Pepuka is working for a particular ministry, and if he embezzles funds, the only thing that happens to him is to move from that particular yes, ministry to another. To another. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing uh, would actually stop because he will actually move with the corrupt tendencies from one ministry and deposit it in another mm -hmm. ministry. But uh, you also forgot to mention that uh, there are some people who have lost their jobs uh, after being fingered in the Auditor General report. And that uh, information is out there in the public. If you check the Auditor General reports, you may see certain ministries which we think have been, uh, they have been incurring or repeat offenses. And we have seen maybe repeat the... Offenses. Why do we have repeat offenses? Exactly. Why is there opportunity for because repeat offenses in the first place? We see the same thing happening year after year after year. And I know you say some people lose their jobs, but the same thing keeps happening. They lose and their jobs eventually. Yes, but still the situation doesn't change. Why? And maybe I should also highlight before Pepe Kai comes in, I should also highlight that... Uh, we have a challenge in the, in the sense that um, when people uh, lose their jobs, it's, now, uh, it's, it's not something that is publicized. Maybe it's not to the public consumption, or maybe you're saying it's available, but I feel that when people lose their jobs, it's okay, but we should look back at our history. We find that previously we have not been doing anything. It's just in the new dispensation that we've seen efforts maybe of dismissal, but it's, it's not very... Uh, substantive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you've okay. So we've talked about the fines ranging from twenty dollars to about uh, ten thousand as an estimate uh, when it was U.S. dollar uh, era. Um, we've talked about dismissal, um, jail sentences. What are we looking at? In terms of jail sentences, mm. um, I may not be privy to the jail sentence for each particular offence. But I think they 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 are very clear uh, in law to say that you know, when someone um, uh, abuses or misuses state resources, they are liable to an offence uh, which may carry this particular sentence. And we have seen some people who are in prison, and some people, like I said, have lost their jobs, and uh, some 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 people have been made to pay fines, and those are the the sanctions that are available. Um, but what I need to emphasize is there is separation of powers. So parliament cannot then go and say um, there was this person who was before the courts who had committed this offense. And uh, based on the evidence that was uh, given to you, 
you say you, you exonerated that individual from any wrongdoing, can we can you bring those papers so that we can also review and see that whether that person is, is, is something to answer? There is separation of powers. So parliament cannot do that. What we can only do is, once those things are exposed, it's up to another arm of, of the state to follow up on the leads, investigate if there is sufficient evidence that uh, an offense has happened. Then they can prosecute and they can, uh, they, they can send that person to jail and they are made to pay a fine or they face the sanctions. If they declare the person is uh, not guilty, it's not up to parliament to then go uh, there and say, why did you declare this person not guilty? So the separation of powers, which we must also understand. Barbara, you're looking I at I think me. this points <laughs> to uh, issues to do with our institutions, uh, besides the parliament, like he's alluding to. We also need uh, other institutions to be strengthened, our judiciary, our executive, because the parliament on its own cannot go further beyond exposing them and uh, if the judiciary is not doing its, its job, it's mm. no longer maybe a blame to put on the parliament. Okay, fair mm. enough. So let's, um, let's move on this with the conversation. Now, uh, Tafalza, maybe you could help me out here. Now, we, uh, could you clarify maybe the role of institutions such as the RBZ and the Ministry of Finance, uh, particularly when we look at public finance management? Oh, okay, um, I'll start with the Minister of Finance. I think uh, in terms of public finance management, uh, it is the sole responsibility of the Minister of Finance to ensure that the resources are kept, uh, actually the resources are collected in a more efficient and effective manner, like I said before. And it is also his role to ensure that um, he comes up with a feasible budget, a budget that is presented before Parliament. It is also his responsibility to oversee the disbursements and expenditures in specific ministries. So all ministries, when they expend, they also report uh, to the Minister of Finance before they report to Parliament. So they have a bigger responsibility in terms of public finance management, including the management of resources that are being utilized within their particular ministry. They also have a responsibility over debt management. Mm -hmm. They have a specific office that resides in the Ministry of Finance, which is the Public Aid and Debt Management Office. And it is their responsibility to ensure that um, loan contraction is done uh, in accordance with our laws and uh, also in accordance with the, the regional best practices. I will actually talk about the, the, the debt to GDP threshold that he mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are a member of SADAC, uh, which SADAC had set a debt to GDP threshold of 60%. But as a country, we, we, we negotiated among ourselves to say that we have a high debt to GDP ratio. So we, we violated the SADAC threshold and said our debt to GDP ratio, for it to be unsustainable, it will be exceeding 70% of, yeah, 70%. So. It is a responsibility of the Ministry of Finance to ensure that we also abide to the regional and international um, treaties and agreements in terms of our policy framework. So it, it has a bigger responsibility uh, beyond just managing the resources uh, that it, it utilizes. And is it doing that efficiently at the moment? Yeah, the Ministry of Finance is, um, is actually doing that. They do have a lot of uh, the public finance management system which they have developed and which should be implemented in the different government ministries. But it is unfortunate that uh, the ministries are also found wanting in terms of uh, implementing the public finance management system. And uh, even the Ministry of Finance itself is also found wanting in terms of implementing its own systems. And the Auditor General's report also highlighted that uh, they, they, they are not doing enough in terms of management of resources. They are also doing, uh, not doing enough in terms of recording of public debt. They have three systems where they are supposed to keep uh, debt figures. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think in 2018, the three uh, systems that they use had different figures in terms of how much has been repaid, how much do we owe. So they, they are also not doing uh, enough. Then the, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe um, <coughs> also has a responsibility in terms of uh, Public Finance Management Act. Um, they, they actually, there's an Arabic Act which states that um, Arabic cannot lend money to government exceeding 20% of the previous year's budget. Mm -hmm. And um, the Reserve Bank itself uh, has to ensure that it abides to that particular uh, act of parliament. And it is also unfortunate that uh, the Reserve Bank at some point 
uh, they were doing quasi physical uh, activities mm. which which activities i'm seeing are also coming, coming back yes. where they uh, borrowed funds uh, and and gave farm implements to individuals mm -hmm. and after years uh, of not repaying uh, for such farm implements we had an arab visit assumption bill where they stated to assume debts that were in incurred by individuals to ensure that uh, Candice and Yolanda and myself and, and all the other ordinary cit citizens have to repay a debt uh, which was amounting to about 1.3 billion uh, US dollars. So Arab is a responsibility and even through the monetary policies that they, they preside over, mm -hmm. they also have a responsibility to ensure that uh, um, what is happening in terms of the money supply does not affect uh, the ordinary citizens. And who holds them accountable? Uh, yeah, the Arab is also accountable to the Minister of Finance, uh, to the Minister of Finance himself, uh, and probably the Permanent Secretary. And they also report uh, well, directly well. to Parliament. Mm -hmm. And who? All institutions are accountable. To <laughs> 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 All right, so we're going to take another short break, um, uh, but we will be back with, of course, our discussion today. So do stay tuned. Now, welcome back. Our discussion today, of course, on the National Purse is understanding public finance management, fiscal frameworks, policies, and the rules. And do remember, this broadcast is brought to you by Zim Papers TV Network and our partners, the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development, ZimCord. Now, before we went for a breather, of course, uh, Tafalza, you had been explaining the role of the RBZ and the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Pepuka, you had something to add to that? Uh... Yeah, uh, the RBZ is the banker to the government. So uh, in w the Ministry of Finance is tasked to manage uh, the government purse. Mm -hmm. And uh, that government purse resides with the RBZ. So it's the, the RBZ is also an advisor to the government and the Minister of Finance. But I wanted to comment on what he was referring to uh, when he was highlighting the issues of thresholds. To say that um, the SADIC, the IMF, the World Bank thresholds are just a guideline. They are not uh, um, a casting stone. So due to differences in economic circumstances, a country may choose to adopt a certain uh, threshold uh, depending on the economic circumstances. For example, the Annex 2 of the SADC Protocol Investment and Trade that he referred to says the debt to GDP ratio of 60% as being sustainable. But uh, due to certain circumstances that are in the country, our government saw it fit to set it at 70 percent but suffice to say that it's not about the figure but it's about the use of the debt uh, japan has an, a debt to gdp threshold of above 100 percent but they've used that debt for development and they have the capacity to repay that debt but if you are using the debt for recurrent expenditure then you may not have the capacity to repay the debt so it's not really about the the, the figure it's about the use of of of, uh, of that uh, that loan, but uh, the figure is there to guide in as far as making sure that it's sustainable. Uh, so the minister of finance is tasked with the responsibility to, to ensure that we don't exceed those thresholds, obviously under the oversight of of parliament. Okay, all right, um, Barbara. Um, let me ask you this question now: What are the recognised international best practices when we are speaking of public um, finance management? There are a number, but maybe I should highlight the key, the major ones. Yes, uh, when we talk of the international best uh, practices in public finance management, we obviously talk about uh, the regulatory or uh, fiscal frameworks. We need to have clear. Um, regulatory and uh, administrative fiscal framework so that uh, all the roles, functions and powers and limits of the fiscal players are clearly delineated. Then we also talk about um, strong leadership support. Uh, across nation states, um, if we have strong leadership support, 
then we also have uh, higher chances of good financial management. In other words, I'm saying that uh, good financial practices, good governance should cascade from the top downwards. And then uh, we also uh, talk about internal and external oversight is another uh, best practices. When we talk of the internal oversight, we are talking about uh, measures uh, at a micro level within government entities. They have uh, audit committees, for example. They also have uh, internal auditors to, to make sure that um, the organizations are adhering to um, the, the law and, make and to make sure that they are also um, internal controls to avoid any mismanagement of funds. Then with the external oversight, we talk of national bodies that are specifically established to, to exercise uh, oversight on government entities. That's whereby we talk of um, the parliament, uh, the role of the Auditor General, we talk about the anti-corruption, in our case we have ZAC, so they, they are also there to provide external oversight, and this is a practice across countries. Mm -hmm. And then we also talk about, besides that, we also talk about um, even public availability of information. When we talk of public finance management, as I indicated earlier on, uh, the citizens, they are the owners, the principals of uh, the public funds, so they have a right uh, to access information pertaining to how public funds are being managed and uh, how they are being utilized. So um, we expect that the information to do with uh, budgeting, information to do with any other financial activities of the government are made available uh, in timely and in great detail to the public. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we also talk about citizen participation. It is also another cornerstone of our good public finance management, um, especially when we look at the budget process, it should be an open process, and uh, which means that the citizens should be involved from uh, in the pre and post budget phases. Uh, they should be involved when we formulate the budget, when we implement the budget, and when we monitor, when we find feedback pertaining the budget. And uh, we also talk about other mechanisms, other principles or best practices uh, like uh, result-based monitoring and evaluation. Whenever we have incurred expenditure in government entities, we should have monitoring, supervise uh, those funds to make sure that they were used for the correct and intended purposes. So these are some of the best practices. Okay, okay. and um, looking at this list of best practices you've given us, where would you place Zimbabwe? <laughs> yeah, the, the, that is a quite a difficult question, but to be honest, mm -hmm. I think we, are, we, we yonder from those practices very much because uh, if we look at um, uh, the budget indexes, we normally rank um, very low in terms of having transparency, in terms of having citizen participation and availability of information. Of course, we, we are improving, we are slowly going there, mm -hmm. but I think we are still very far. Okay, um, Tafazwa, what would the importance be of having, um, you know, like she says, one of the things is having this information public. Uh, people need access to it. What is the importance of that? Oh, okay, um, I will I just speak to annual inflation. We last had annual inflation figures in 2019, June, mm -hmm. which information is quite important to ordinary citizens, uh, be it business, is it um, labor? Is it investors? Uh, investors mm -hmm. um, and, and even researchers. But then the government decides that our economic situation, like what Mr. Jibore said, um, it does not allow us to publish the inflation figures. Uh, we need to contain it and then present it in February 2020. And then eagerly waiting for that, 2020 monetary policy statement was presented and that annual inflation figure is still a preserve of the government. So that information is quite important. Citizens need information simply because we are the holders. You know, government holds the national purse, mm -hmm. but the resources in that purse belongs to the citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, citizens want information uh, pertaining to what, what, what police priorities government uh, wants to do and not just being informed, but being involved in setting those priorities. Yeah. And uh, even the, the vision 2030 that we talk about, it's a vision that is implemented through medium-term plans. 
we are just concluding our transitional stabilization program. We are starting on negotiations around the next short medium term plan. And all those short term plans, medium term plans, they are implemented through a short term plan which is called a budget. And that information concerning the TSP, whatever medium term plan we are going to adopt, the broader vision 2030, citizens should participate in those processes. They should have access to information in terms of why did we arrive at this. And it also makes life easier for government or the implementing agent uh, because when citizens are involved, they also own the process. But if you want information and the information is not made available to citizens, it is very difficult for citizens to make decisions. I'll also talk about um, the current uh, issue around what is happening in the black market. You know, our economy is now being run in, in the streets mm. where people trade forex for RTGS mm. bond or for transfers at different rates. Uh, Zimbabwe is one country where people can trade coins for notes mm. of the same currents. And um, we are leaving uh, our economy to chance because citizens do not have information. They only base uh, their decisions on speculation. And uh, I think, uh, for example, we are talking about the COVID virus. If you don't provide information, uh, reliable information concerning COVID, there are certain other sources of information that will release that information and it will cause panic. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what is happening in Zimbabwe in terms of our economy. Uh, we have alternative sources of information which can rate inflation in Zimbabwe above 500%. And what then happens when an investor uh, comes across an information that says inflation in Zimbabwe is at 500%? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know um, the situation in Zimbabwe is that citizens don't have access to information and whatnot, but in an ideal setup, what would be the role of the citizen in public finance management? How would they play their part? Okay, um, yeah, citizens, they also have a specific and clear role to play in, in public finance management, apart from just paying taxes. But uh, by virtue of paying taxes, we create a social contract between the government and the citizens, which social contract uh, allows or ensures that government reports to the citizens. So in the absence of information being given to citizens, the citizens have a right to demand that uh, access to information. They have a right to demand for the provision of public services, which the government might not have been providing. They have a right to protect their rights because they are, are, uh, their rights are realized through a budget. A right to education, for example, a right to health, a right to safe and potable water. It's attached to specific figures in the budget. So citizens have a right to protect uh, their rights by demanding from the government, either directly or indirectly through parliament. A parliament is a, a platform where citizens, either individually or either as groups of individuals, can submit petitions to parliament mm -hmm. to say that um, the, 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 the current constitutional amendment, which is taking away the powers of parliament, will not do any good in terms of public finance management. So they have a right to submit petitions to parliament, which petitions I'm sure parliament is ready to act upon. I hope you are not trying to influence citizens <laughs> to petition parliament on that particular section. No, but how does that process work? If I, am, uh, if I disagree with something in particular that's going on in parliament, um, especially when we are talking about public finance management, how would I then go about uh, getting this petition to you? Um, the petition proce process is provided for in section 149 of the constitution. Any citizen any organization or an, any individual can approach parliament with a petition on any issue that they are aggrieved of or that they want parliament to address as long as it is within the purview of parliament and the uh, parliament will sit down and look at uh, whether that petition is admissible and in terms of admissibility we are looking at whether it is not infringing on the rights of other citizens and whether it is not an issue that is before, say, the courts or that is being handled by another arm of the state. You can't bring an issue that is before the courts, before parliament, for mm -hmm. them to consider. So they will look at the admissibility. If it's not admissible, they will tell you. And if it's admissible, they will also tell you that it's admissible and we are working on it. And parliamentary rules and procedures specify the number of days 
and the process of uh, attending to a petition. So as things tend, it's 26 days. Within 26 days, they would they have responded to you, tell you the process that they, they have engaged in and what they are doing. But if you will allow me mm -hmm. also to highlight some of the best principles and tie them in with what we have been doing in as far as improving public finance management in the country's consent, one of the best principles is comprehensiveness. Um, you must include all revenue or expenditure for all agencies. And the previously, we have seen that local authorities and state-owned enterprises have not been uh, under the spotlight of the Public Finance Management Act. And the Parliament has passed the Public Entities Corporate Governance Act, and also uh, the state uh, local authorities have been brought under the purview of the Auditor General. Now their accounts are audited by the Auditor General. So it's one of the uh, reforms that the government has undertaken to ensure that it's comprehensive. Then there are issues of accuracy. Uh, you must record actual transactions and flows. Uh, and there have been uh, various statements thrown around uh, around the accuracy of even debt figures, like Chikumbo was saying, around the accuracy of aid that we received from China, from U.S. government. It's one of the principles that our statements must be must be accurate. Mm -hmm. Then there is the issue of authoritativeness, uh, which means that we must only spend what is authorized by the law. If you spend outside what is authorized, then uh, you need to seek the necessary approvals from the relevant authorities. But uh, one thing I also need to comment on is the issue of transparency. Uh, Barbara mentioned that we need to be transparent and uh, information needs to be timely, needs to be available to the public. We have realized that the budget by nature is very comprehensive and very technical. And we have taken it upon ourselves as parliament uh, to try to simplify budget information. If you go to the parliament website, there is a document called the citizen's budget, which simplifies the budget in simple, plain language, non-technical language. Mm -hmm. So you, as citizens, read that document. Then you engage government, you engage parliament from an informed point of view. Because that lays the budget in simple, non-technical language. And that copies will be distributed through their members of parliament. So citizens need to read that. Once they read those things, then they need to engage in, 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 uh, in public finance management. All right. Now, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, there is still so much we could have discussed. Uh, but just in conclusion, um, we will give you each an opportunity to very briefly let us know what would you like to see happening um, with our current state of public um, finance management going forward. Um, we've, yes, we've noted that there's been improvements, but what do we need to work on now particularly? I'll start off with... Uh, no, not you, Tafazo. I'll start with Barbara. <laughs> okay, thank you, Candice. Uh, I think in as far as uh, our public finance laws are concerned, we have very comprehensive laws. But what needs to be done is to ensure compliance with those laws. So moving forward, we expect the parliament to play uh, its oversight role effectively to ensure that all the fiscal players um, are doing uh, their business uh, in line with the confinements or the purview of the law. And uh, I think if we manage to make sure that we implement what is all uh, stipulated in those laws, then we are going to their promises of reaching India. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Pipke? Um, I would want to see strengthening of the uh, public finance management laws. I would also want to see greater citizen involvement because they are, uh, they, are, they are required to be involved. Uh, section 13, Section 141 of the Constitution, they should be involved. Uh, we don't want passive citizens who just uh, relax and accept everything that comes from the government. They should be involved. Out of interest, has there been any citizens who have come forward and brought a case to Parliament? Uh, we have received so many petitions from citizens ranging from uh, uh, touching on various sectors of the economy and we have seen citizens coming out to our public hearings and to our public gatherings being involved in uh, what Parliament is doing and also trying to strengthen public finance management in Zimbabwe. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. Finally with you. Yeah, um, for me I would like to see the government implementing the recommendations, the recommendations of the Auditor General. I think um, we know what is happening in our institutions and the recommendations are clear in terms of how do we correct that. And uh, we look forward to a government that respects those recommendations and ensure that they are followed up to. Uh, I also want to see, like what Chiwara said, uh, opportunities where citizens are allowed to participate in the budget process. Uh, of course, we have financial limitations, 
that um, does not allow parliament to go to every center, but uh, they should also try as much as they can to take away um, to take away the, the meetings from the boardrooms to ensure that ordinary citizens are not threatened to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, even the current um, constitutional amendment bill, uh, in the case of Harare, the consultations are going to take place at uh, the Ambassador Hotel, and uh, we, we want the government or parliament to take up the public finance management issues and ensure that citizens participate in those forums. All right. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, thank you so much for participating in, of course, today's uh, discussion. Now, to our audience, of course, your feedback is always welcome. So please do make sure that you are dropping it through our social media platforms. If you're on Facebook, that's Zim Papers TV Network. Um, if you are on Twitter, it's at ZTN News. And, of course, uh, our website, ztn.co.zw. And, of course, remember, this live broadcast was brought to you by ZTN and our partners, the Zimbabwe Coalition on Debt and Development, Zimcod. That's all for today. Join us again next week. Thank you for watching. And I'm Candice. Goodbye.